There are times in life when you may feel that you are all alone. And sometimes you feel that way because there is no one around. But just having someone there with you doesn't mean that you don't feel alone. I'm fairly convinced that one of the loneliest places on earth is the London Underground in rush hour when all the trains are running. If the trains stop, people talk, but if everything's all running as clockwork, you can be there surrounded by hundreds of people and be totally alone. So it's having those people around you, isn't it? Those people who are close to you, who value your existence. Now there is a time for solitude. There are times when it's good for us to get away, to spend time with the Lord, to be by ourselves. But there's other times, especially when someone is facing a problem. During those times, they really do not want to be alone. And thanks to this dreadful pandemic, we are now surrounded by huge numbers of people who have had to face a period of great difficulty, a period of great trouble, all alone. Or maybe they're just there with their husband or their wife, but they feel isolated, they feel separated. They're out of their depth, they're scared. And to make matters worse, some of them may have underlying health problems that have just added to their anxiety. Loneliness and problems lead to stress, anxiety and depression. And these are all emotions that we can sense as we read the words from the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 4. If church tradition is correct, this passage that we're looking at now are the last recorded words of the Apostle Paul because shortly after he wrote this letter, he was executed. And we can see that he is under great stress. His problem is that he's in a prison cell and he knows where it's going to leave. We can also get the sense that he's not particularly well at the moment. He's got Luke, who was a physician, a doctor with him, and he's feeling the cold which is a sign that he's sick, so he needs his cloak. And he does seem to be quite down. But despite all these reasons to despair, he doesn't because he knows what we also need to remember when we face trouble. Paul knows that he is never alone. And as we go through days of trouble, as we go through days when we feel all by ourselves, we need to remember that we are never alone. And as we read this passage, we get that sense coming out. Because when you first read this uh, passage, it feels quite pessimistic, it feels quite down. But when we start to dig into it a bit deeper, we discover that it's not as bad as we may think on our first reading. Because when we start to look at the different people that Paul mentions, and then we try and work out what they're doing, then we see that there is a lot of good and a lot of encouragement in this passage amongst this difficulty that Paul is facing. Now, some of the names mentioned here are people who are busy serving the Lord. But it's also um, a bit of a mixture because some of the people who are mentioned here are doing the the exact opposite of Christ's kingdom. So, um, as we look at this group... um, I think it's a bit like uh, what most of us do when you go to the supermarket and you want to buy one of those punnets of strawberries. You pick it up, don't you? And you give it a little bit of a shake and you see whether or not there's any furry ones hidden down in the corners um, or a few that are badly bruised. And you probably pick up three or four punnets before deciding on the one that doesn't look too bad. So there's always going to be some good fruit and there's going to be some bad fruit. As we go through this passage, I want to deal with the bad fruit first, and then we can encourage ourselves by looking at the good fruit. So we're going to start off with the worst, and this is the one that's definitely gone a bit furry. Um, That's Alexander, the metal worker. And we're not too sure who this person is. Um, Paul did hand an Alexander over to Satan in 1 Timothy 1 verse 20 to teach him not to blaspheme. So Alexander may be someone who has been excommunicated from the church in Ephesus. Uh, We also learn that he's a metal worker. And if you think back to Acts chapter 19, at verse 23 going forwards, when Paul was in Ephesus, there was a great riot that was started by the metal workers in Ephesus because the gospel had been so successful, no one was buying their little metal idols of Diana. Um, Diana, who is, of course, now recognized as Wonder Woman in the uh, DC world. Um, So 
They, so he's got that two thing. He could be the guy who was kicked out of um, the church, or he could just be a random metal worker who was part of that riot. We just don't know which one he is, or if he was someone else, because Alexander was a very common name. I'm sure you can all know about Alexander the Great, and the Greeks were still naming their children after that great general who did so much for them um, uh, centuries earlier. What is clear is that this man, whoever he is, either through commercial loss or a personal vendetta, now has it in for Paul. And there's nothing like having an enemy out to destroy you to really take away your peace of mind. And quite a few commentators think that this Alexander may have been involved in the arrest of Paul. One of the things that the uh, scholars do is they try and reconstruct the events that uh, happened during the life of Paul. And they use scripture and maybe a bit of church tradition as well. When we talk about church tradition, we're talking about the teachings of the early church fathers, the people who were writing um, immediately after the New Testament uh, was uh, written. There's a whole raft of writings which have come down to us, which are not recognized as scripture, and maybe we don't know much about them. But they teach us a lot about the history of the early church. And they would talk about various things. So these people, they put together these sources of information, and they try and reconstruct what happens. And they think something like this has happened. So if you can picture the scene, Paul, he's traveling to Ephesus, and he's gone to a place called Troas. Now, Troas is the gateway to Asia Minor. That's what we know as Turkey. It was the crossing point. So all the travelers went into that hub. I suppose it'd be a bit like going into an airport today where people would come into Heathrow or Gatwick or Manchester. It was a travel hub. Um, Troas was the place where Paul had the dream of the man from Macedonia. So uh, he, took a, he headed from Troas into Europe. Now he's coming back on, on his way to Ephesus and he gets arrested in Troas by the Romans. Um, the Emperor Nero is there, he's got it in for Christians, and Paul is a well-known Christian, so you can imagine a warrant has gone out for his arrest. And they think that Alexander helped the authorities identify who Paul was. So he's the one who, as it were, pointed the finger and said, that's the man. So Paul gets suddenly and unexpectedly arrested by the Romans, and he was planning to go to Ephesus, and suddenly they take him back to Rome. And that means his mission team is scattered all over that corner of the Mediterranean, and they just haven't had time to get back to him. So there's people out doing various things, and he's got to go quickly. He's had to leave his personal belongings behind, and some folk who were with him, they just were too sick to travel. They couldn't cope with the sudden change of direction, so they've had to be left behind. And he's taken back to Rome, and straight away, there's a preliminary hearing. So he's marched into Rome, and they have a hearing to work out exactly what they're going to do with him. And that, at that point, Paul could have been executed, but he hasn't. So he's been deserted by everyone. His friends haven't been able to get to him. There were people around who could have supported him who haven't, um, but the Lord has stood by with him. He's got through that trial, and now he's waiting for his main trial. And one of the things which, with, with Roman justice, which... Um, it may be a little bit different to ours. In a, a Roman trial, the people didn't just stand up and say, I'm innocent. In a Roman trial, people were able to stand up and argue their case. So they were able to share their beliefs and why they were doing things. So Paul is busy preparing for that second trial. Now he knows that Nero has got it in for Christians, and he knows what's going to be the outcome of that trial, but he's got, going to have this opportunity so that's the sort of thing that is going on. So he's languishing in his cell. He's waiting for his final trial. He knows that he's going to die after it, but he's going to use it as an opportunity to preach the gospel one last time. He's not going to plead innocence. He's not going to try and get away with it. He is going to be bold and firm and stand up for his faith. He also knows that it's going to be a little while until this hearing happens. So he summons Timothy back to him, instructing him to pick up his left-behind items on the way. Well, this is all supposition, but it's informed supposition. People fit in pieces of a puzzle together, and it does sort of fit the situation that we see developing in this passage and explain a lot of things. 
It may be completely wrong, but it is an explanation. So, Paul is writing to Timothy, and one of the things he's doing is he warns him about Alexander. Now, he's not denouncing Alexander, but rather Timothy is his friend, and he's saying to him, stay out the way of this man. Do not go near him. He's out to get us. So he's warning his friend to be on guard. And even while he's in prison, Paul knows that even though human forces seem to have got the upper hand, the Lord is in control. Paul is only in prison because it is the Lord's will. Remember how in the past he's been in prison and the Lord has rescued him. He knows that this time is different. He knows that it's the Lord's will that he is there at that point. Yet he also knows that the Lord will hold Alexander responsible for his deeds. And that's one of those lines that's sort of in there. And it just reminds us of the fact that every single sin ever committed carries a cost, and that cost will be paid. It was either paid by the Lord Jesus Christ as he hung on the cross, um, and he died for the, in place of all of us who would have put our trust in him, or the sins will be accredited to that person's account. And sometimes judgment comes in this life and things happen, but the full judgment waits for that time when people are thrown into hell. Every wrong deed carries a cost, and every cost will be paid for. And Alexander will be held responsible for his deeds. Forgiveness will be available for him if he trusts in Christ, but if not, he will have to face it himself. And that's the same for everyone today. It's the same for the people who persecute Christians around the world. It's the same for people who may persecute us in our own society. While forgiveness is available, every sin carries a cost. Well, alongside Alexander, the other rotten fruit in the basket is Demas. And this is a really sad case. Because Demas has been a co-worker of Paul. He's mentioned in the letter to the Colossians, and he's mentioned in Philemon. But now, when Paul really needed him, Demas has left Paul in the lurch. And Demas is not guilty of a simple act of cowardice. cowardice. That's a failing where forgiveness is available. Just think of the disciples and how they were restored. Instead, Demas has loved the world more than he's loved Christ. And he's deserted and he's gone to Thessalonica. And this sad case reminds us that being close to a great Bible teacher does not make you any better off. More than proximity is needed. Faith in Christ is needed for salvation and obedience to God's word is required for a healthy Christian life. Simply being close to a good Bible teacher means nothing unless you do what he teaches. And this is an important lesson for us to learn because we live in an age when there is a real cult of celebrity which has sadly infiltrated the church. A problem which has actually been made worse by COVID-19 and people worshipping at home. Why listen to your local minister who knows you and knows about your situation when you can tune into the really good stuff from a top Bible teacher? Listening to sermons from top teachers being their Facebook friend, or even being on talking terms with them, does not make you a better Christian unless you apply the teaching that they bring. Demas had every opportunity while with Paul, but time proved that he wasn't really a believer because he did not persist to the end. It's one of the things that we see repeatedly. We see our Lord saying it, we see Paul saying it, that the true believer will persist to the end while the person who has either deceived themselves or the person who is a a false believer, um, they will not persist to the end. They will fall away. And that's what's happened to Demas. And Paul is clearly upset by this. Demas had been a trusted colleague. He would have been a friend. And right now, Paul would have felt like he'd been stabbed in the back just when he needed help and support. Have you ever been stabbed in the back like that when you need help? It's that most painful thing, isn't it? When you just need a hand up and instead you get pushed down. But before we denounce uh, Demas completely, we need to be careful not to fall into this trap ourselves and base our spiritual health, our Christianity, on the people that we know or the books that we read rather than upon our relationship with the Lord. And we also need to warn other people about this because I know that in some homes, 
there's this sort of idea where there's one holy person, as it were, and that holy person, they'll go off to church, and the rest of the family, they won't. They may mock a bit or something like that. But they're thinking in their hearts that because their relative, their family member goes to church, on the day that they appear before the Lord, their family member will be able to get them into heaven. And people believe that. And they don't go to church because their husband, their wife, their children, their auntie, their uncle, someone close to them is going to church and they'll get them in. And that's a terrible situation to be in because the only way to get into heaven is when we trust ourselves in the Lord Jesus Christ when we realise that we are sinners, when we realise that we are dirty and we deserve to go to hell, and then we see the wonders that the Lord Jesus has done, how he's died in the place of all those who will believe in him, and we put our trust, we put our faith in the completed work of Christ, in his death and resurrection. And it is that faith in Christ, that is the only thing that will get us into heaven. And we cannot do that for another person. We need to understand we cannot do it for another person and the people around us need to understand that, they, uh, that another person cannot do it for them. They can't rely upon someone else to get them into heaven. Instead, we need to be making that personal commitment ourselves. So, if you are someone who's in that situation or you know of people in that situation, please warn them because that's the loving thing to do warn them that they need to be making that personal um, commitment. It may be difficult, and you may have to wait until the time is right, but you do need uh, to uh, be doing that. Well, that's all of the bad fruit looked at. Um, let's spend a few minutes now just looking at some of the good fruit. As we look at these people, it becomes clear that even though Paul has been shut up in prison, the work of sharing the gospel continues. And the first sort of positive name that we've got mentioned here is someone called Crescens. And this is a Latin name, and his name actually means increasing. And he's only mentioned here in Scripture. But church tradition tells of a Crescens who went to a place in Europe that was also called Galatia in Romans times. And this man founded churches in northern Italy and in southern France. Um, so this is the next generation after Paul, and the gospel is continuing to advance. You know, and if this is the same person uh, that church tradition has uh, reported to us, it gives us that tantalizing glimpse into how the Christian message and the gospel spread throughout the Roman uh, Empire. So this man, he may not be with Paul in Rome, but he's following in Paul's footsteps and taking the gospel to new areas. Titus is far more familiar to us. Like Timothy, he seems to be one of Paul's troubleshooters, and he's off on a, another errand. Um, the letter written uh, to Titus was, writ was written to him when he was sent to Crete, and now Paul has sent him on another errand to a region he has already visited. It seems that uh, Titus and Timothy were away from Paul doing gospel work, but he's not completely alone because Luke is with him. Luke is, of course, another familiar name. He wrote down a gospel in the book of Acts, and when the uh, Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts are put together, you'll find that that's a large slice of the New Testament because they're both very long books. They are so, um, Luke wrote a lot of the New Testament. However, Paul would now like Timothy back with him before his end comes. So he sent instructions to Timothy, probably using Tychicus as uh, a messenger. And the instructions are, drop everything. Travel quickly. Pick up my scrolls and cloak because winter is coming. Now the content of the, scroll, of the scrolls is another mystery. They could have been legal documents such as Paul's Roman citizenship. You can see that maybe he was nabbed in the street and taken away and he wasn't able to get his possessions. Or it could be a copy of the Old Testament which he wants for study. Or even just blank parchments so that for him to write on. Because in those days um, such things were quite difficult to get hold of. He's also instructed to bring Mark with him. Now, the story of Mark is one of those wonderfully encouraging stories of restoration. As a young man, Mark abandoned Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. And when the second journey came along, Barnabas wanted to take his cousin along with him, but Paul refused. And this led to a disagreement and a parting of ways between these two great evangelists. 
But now, many years later, there has been forgiveness and reconciliation. Paul recognises the value of Mark. Mark, of course, is the one who went on to write the second uh, gospel. We all make mistakes. Maybe we don't fulfil our duties or we are too hard-hearted to give someone a second chance. But forgiveness is possible. We are to forgive others as the Lord forgave us. And once uh, this forgiveness happens, broken relationships can be restored. And this is good news for all of us because we know that hanging on to grudges and bringing up stuff that happened years and years ago really does not do any good at all. In fact, if you don't forgive people, you will often end up very alone because it's impossible for people to spend time with each other without upsetting each other every so often. So we need to be people who are ready to forgive. We have to admit that we make, mistake, uh, make mistakes and that other people make mistakes as well. We need to be ready to admit fault and be ready to accept apologies and then move on. For Mark, he had made a mistake. Maybe Paul had been too hard-hearted and made a mistake as well. But they were able to get it sorted out and they were able to work together. So we can see that Paul is gathering a team of trusted individuals around him to provide support during his second trial. But at the first trial, he had found himself all alone. Maybe the speed of his arrest meant that his supporters just could not get there in time. Maybe the church in Rome that was under pressure from the Emperor Nero, who became one of the worst persecutions of the church, just kept a low profile when Paul was brought in. But Paul shows a forgiving spirit by saying that the desertion of those able to support him should not be held against them. Everyone makes mistakes, and Paul shows that he forgives people their mistakes. Uh, other members of his team had been left behind. Humanly speaking, Paul was all by himself, but he was not alone. In Luke 12, verses 11 to 12, Jesus says, When you were brought before synagogues, rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you would defend yourselves or what you would say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Our Lord, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, is with his people in every situation that they face. He will give us the right words at the right time. And Paul experienced this firsthand. He would have had to appear before some very important people, maybe even before the emperor himself. In this situation, the Lord gave him the strength he needed so that he didn't back down or try and defend himself, but rather the gospel message was proclaimed. It could have resulted in the death penalty, but the Lord rescued Paul. It's very reassuring to know that the Lord is always with us. It's reassuring to know that the Lord is with every person who trusts in him. Now, in one sense, God is always with every person all of the time because he fills all of his creation. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. But this passage means more than just this general presence of God in all places because God's presence is experienced in different ways in different places. So when we gather together for worship, we experience the Lord's presence quite differently <clears throat> in a much more close fashion than we do when we're sitting down at home watching TV. The Lord is still present there, but we feel his presence differently when we gather for worship. And it's the same with our quiet times, isn't it? We often feel the Lord's presence differently. And when we are standing up for the Lord, when we are in a place of difficulty, when we are stepping out of our comfort zone, the Lord's presence is with us, and we often feel that. So Paul, going through this trial, he felt like Jesus was standing right next to him. An experience which Jesus, our high priest, went through himself. Remember that our Lord was abandoned by his disciples when he was arrested. Jesus knows what it is like to be all alone and facing a situation that leads to a terrible outcome. He stands with his people during those times of trial so that they are never alone. Also, like Paul, they know that even the worst that this world can throw at them, it is not the end. As Christians, we know that there is more to this life. For the people of this world, this life is all that there is. It's all that they think about. And in the eyes of the Roman rulers, a prison cell with a death penalty at the end was shameful. But for Paul, who sees the big picture, he knows that it is glorious. Paul knows that when his time came, 
the Lord would carry him to safely into his heavenly kingdom. Until that day came, Paul knew that he would be rescued from every evil attack. And when that day arrived, it would be to his advantage. Paul would go to be with Jesus. He would see the glory of the Lord firsthand. And he would know that all of his trials and struggles were over. Everything he had worked towards would be shown to be right, while every sacrifice made would be well worth making. It's no wonder that Paul breaks out into one of his short outbursts of praise once again. But this time it's not directed to God the Father. It is directed to our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul is able to worship when he only has Luke with him and when he is facing the death penalty. This just reminds us that when we know the Lord and understand more about him and how he expects us to serve him in this life, we should be able to worship in any situation. After praising the Lord, Paul moves on to give some personal greetings, which just reminds us that even though Paul was feeling all alone in Rome, he was not without friends, colleagues and supporters elsewhere. People who would be praying for him and supporting him. And this just reminds us of the importance of praying for and supporting people that we know who are doing the Lord's work elsewhere, in other parts of the UK, in other parts of the world. Whenever we pray, it doesn't matter how far away we are from anyone, the Lord hears our prayers for them. So these are people who would be praying for Paul, people who were good friends of him. And some of these names are familiar to us from other parts of Scripture, others are mentioned only here. Some, some of the things mentioned are people and, and situations that Timothy needs to know about. What is clear from this is that Paul is never a one-man band. He was never alone in ministry. He was always part of a team. And this is how the Lord continues to work today. While we may find ourselves facing periods of loneliness and isolation, as Christians we are always part of an extended family. We are part of the people of God. There are folk around us who can pray for us and encourage us, even if they are not able to meet with us face to face. And as Christians, it is so encouraging that we never face challenges alone. Whatever you are facing, no matter how isolated you may feel, the Lord is always with his people. And, uh, he, uh, and we also have one another to support each other. With this thought in mind, the Apostle Paul closes off this letter with what, with what may be his last recorded words. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you all. And it's appropriate that the Apostle who preached so much about the grace that God shows us um, in the Gospel message closes by saying, grace be with you all. His prayer is that Timothy and the church in Ephesus will know both the presence of the Lord and the grace that flows from our Saviour. For us today, this passage contains a lot of personal encouragement because if we're honest with ourselves, we often feel quite alone and maybe forgotten. But Jesus is with us in every situation and in every situation we are able to worship him as he helps us in our time of need. We also need to appreciate the people that the Lord has placed in our lives more and do what we can to support and encourage one another. We need to realise that whatever we face, we are never alone. Amen.